Hey everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Military Surplus Firearm Collecting. I'm Mike B, and today we're going to be talking about a very important topic that can get a lot of newbies in trouble. I've had this almost happen to me, but because of some good friends that were in the hobby a lot longer than me that weren't assholes, I was able to n save myself quite a bit of, you know, heartache and money and all that stuff. And this is going to be about buying the rifle or the gun and not the story. So... A lot of people that are in the firearm selling business or just in general that own them are either willfully ignorant and don't know what the hell they're talking about, which a lot of times is the case, or you also get the people that can spot your lack of experience and they'll try to take advantage of you by hyping you up because my history and they know. They automatically assume too if you're younger that you really don't know anything about history and they do and they're experts. And there's no need to confront these people if you actually are figuring out that they're trying to do this. There's no need to confront them because most of the time they just get huffy and storm off and, you know, talk about, oh, God, goddamn kids today. I know what I got. I know my history. And I'm going to actually just kind of go over a few anecdotal examples of these um, types of situations using the top two rifles as the anecdotes. And then we'll go to the bottom one, which you can see might actually have a story behind it. So the top one is something that's really, it's posted on forums, I've heard it in person, at gun shows, gun shops, from people who quote unquote know history, a lot of old timers that, you know, they just cannot be convinced otherwise. <clears throat> oh, my grandpa or my dad brought back this, this Japanese Type 90, or they don't even know the model, this Ar Ariska or this rifle, and uh, yeah, he got it from a dead Japanese sniper that he shot out of the tree with his BAR, or enter US weapon here. And then, yeah, the sniper fell out of the tree and he grabbed the rifle and, and he sent it home. Well, 9.9 9 .9 times out of 10, that's going to be completely bullshit and here's why. First of all, you couldn't just mail guns home. The mail service wasn't that great and you had to go through an extensive process of getting it signed off as a war trophy or something like that. I don't know what they called them a war trophy back then. Basically, it, you had to get paperwork signed. If you're in combat, generally, most of the time you're not going to give a shit about one certain rifle. And if you do, um, you're, I don't know what, what's going on in your head, but like it's more important to survive than actually pick up a rifle or a souvenir. So, yeah, and that, that's not just for the Japanese Type 99 or Osaka. It's for, we'll, we'll get there in a second to the K98. But what happened was most of these rifles after the armistice was signed in 1945, and so the war is over officially in the South Pacific, these rifles were turned over to the Americans and the Allies in the hundreds of thousands. They had, took the bolts out of them most of the time, and they threw them in huge piles, and they literally said, take one if you want one for a hunting rifle as you're going home. And that's why most of the dust covers are missing on a lot of these. The, the chrysanthemums are ground, um, the aircraft sites, because any unnecessary metal they use to melt down and all that stuff. So that's what happened with most of these. That's why they don't have an import mark on them. Now... There were a few examples of intact rifles being thrown in these piles or people actually mailing them home. However, it wasn't a super common occurrence because if you're in combat, you're generally not going to have enough time or the energy or the you know motivation to actually go through the process of doing that every time you kill somebody or see somebody be killed and you have a cool story. It's just not factually correct. Also, ow, that was dumb. Sorry if I scared you on that one. I scared myself too. I just, was like talking with my hands even though you can't see and oh geez and I'm gonna have a coronary here in a second all right we're gonna recover from that and we're gonna just keep going um anyway so that's generally what happened with these rifles now it it, it seems that everybody's got to have a cool story especially we're moving on to the k98 so same thing yep grandpa got this off a dead nazi uh ss whatever you know the most elite people that they think exist Yep, he took it right off of him after he shot him in the face or stabbed him with a bayonet or punched him with a trench knife or, you know, some other spectacular glorified shit. I literally had a person, a friend of a friend, tell me this while he was showing me a K-98 and I'm like, huh, so he took this off of a dead soldier and, you know, that he had just killed, carried it, lugged it through the rest of the, the, the battle, the fight, and then found the time to get pulled back to the rear miraculously because he had a rifle and he sent it home. Yep, yep, that's what he did. It was so, it was such a cool experience for him, and that's why I'm like, okay, well, there's a couple things wrong with your story there. One, you have a bolt mismatch. Generally speaking, 
rifles, K98s that were brought back actually or sent back were matching, right? That's where you're going to find a lot of those, those examples. And then to top that off, dude, and I showed him the Sentry import mark on the bottom of the barrel. I was like, you have an import marked rifle, which means at, at least it came in after 1968. So I'm like, your story is complete bullshit and you're just telling people this and you're spreading misinformation. So, and he was, you know, a lot of people, they'll, they'll buy the story. They'll be like, yep, got this off of a dead Nazi. And it's like, oh, for some people, they find that, you know, amazing and all that stuff. It's like, no, most of the time, it's the same story as the Japanese ones. Like, they were either found just laying in a pile or after the war, they decided to send one home. Very rarely is there like an actual story and i mean how are you going to prove it either like even back then you don't have you don't have an iphone you can't film the firefight go up and take the rifle off and be like yep here's the dead guy here's the rifle here's the serial numbers and i'm going to send it home and it, come on really so again it might be true who knows but there's no way to prove it so don't pay extra and don't go crazy because somebody's got a cool made up you know story like that so that, that kind of goes along with my, you know, veterans don't always remember things right and uh, a lot of myths stem from the military. So if you haven't seen those videos uh, on stupid gun myths, go check that out. Another cool series. But anyway, so we're going to get to the third one now. And the third one, let's see if I can zoom in on this a little bit. So this is one that I've made a few videos on. All right, I don't know how clear that's going to be, guys. I apologize in advance if it's not focusing or whatever. Anyway, I suppose I can just pick it up and show you guys. So this is a Chinese Type 56 SKS that was sent as aid to Albania in the 1960s and 70s. And I made videos on this before because I think it's really cool. So this has got this guy's name in here and the city that he hailed from or whatever or was there. I ended up finding out that there's only like two letter Rakipis in the world, right? And one of them, who fits the bill, is actually, I think he just got out of prison recently in Albania. Because during the 1997 kind of, you know, shit show that happened in Albania where they're just people going nuts um he was one of the criminals in a gang that stole a bunch of weapons from an armory but he was also in the albanian army in the early to mid 90s so he could have done that carving there or he could have done it to mark that it was his as a, as a criminal which also maybe isn't likely anyway i got this from aim surplus so they didn't even they didn't have a story they didn't have you know it's the same price as all the other you know shooter grade they call them i love these these things they're so cool um, they're cheaper and they don't look as pretty, which is fine because that means I don't feel as bad about beating them up out in the woods. Anyway, so staying on topic, if somebody was going to sell me this SKS, or if I, okay, if I was going to sell this SKS to somebody, which I'm probably never going to, and I said I, I went through this whole spiel about the story that I was told and all that stuff, and that I talked about in that video, and I said I want six hundred and fifty dollars for this SKS that I paid three hundred for. Just because that story, and I know it's true, and I, in my heart it's true, and somebody goes, wow, that's a cool piece of history, and it, it, it adds intrinsic value. Can you print that story out? Sure, absolutely, I'll do that for free. I would be taking advantage of somebody big time. And, I mean, granted, they're, you know, a fool and their money are soon parted with, but I don't, I couldn't, I couldn't feel right screwing somebody over that bad. Now, if I was asking, like, 400 bucks for it, you know, that's still a gray area, but, I mean, fine, I, I went through and cleaned it and all that stuff. But again, buy the rifle, or you know, buy the gun, not the story. So you can see something that's cool like that, but who knows, maybe some kid did this, maybe some kid named Leonard Rakipi who got sick, you know, he was in his teens, carved this into his dad's stock or something, and you know, at home, and his dad got mad at it and didn't want to further damage the gun. Who knows? There's no way of knowing. Unless you've got definitive proof, again, buy the object, buy the gun, or the bayonet, or whatever, not the story. So, just my two cents on that. It's actually more than two cents. God, these videos are running so much longer than I anticipate. Sorry I get rambly, but I just wanted to do a couple anecdotes and examples to show you why it probably isn't a good idea to buy the story. Sure, it, it might be cool and everything, but pay retail, in which, I mean, we'll get into how to assess things and market value and all that stuff in this series, but don't pay over retail or what you think it's worth just because somebody has a story attached to it. All right, we're done ranting. So... Thank you for watching, everybody. I do appreciate it. If you like this series and this channel and you want to support my work, the link to my Patreon is in the description. It's a dollar a month, five bucks a month or more. gets into my Discord server, which I think is a great time. A lot of fun on there, cool conversations, a lot of information being exchanged. I'm learning stuff, which is always cool. 
And uh, yeah, it also, it just supports the channel's uh, cost a little bit because I can't afford to do most of the videos that I want to do for just funding out of pocket, like helmet ballistic tests. I want to get into body armor ballistic tests someday. That's a lot of money. Um, just historical educational videos like this. Um, you know, I want to go up and shoot these pieces of history, all that stuff. Um, so it really does help fund the channel that way and help me be able to make more content that I otherwise couldn't. So... The link to that is in the description. Again, if you can't do that, I totally understand that. It's not a problem. I really just do appreciate you watching. So if you got any questions, I'll try to answer them. Um, yeah, I'm not really an expert. I'm just an average Joe who likes to collect military surplus stuff. So anyway, thank you for watching again, everybody. I do appreciate it. And we'll see you on the next episode of Military Surplus Firearm Collecting.